we're going to talk about tarot tonight and specifically its relation to Kabbalah and then we will be breaking down the symbolism of the tarot. Actually, we'll be doing this kind of in conjunction uh, at the same time simultaneously. Um, I'll be breaking down the symbolism and relating it to the tarot tradition, uh, to the Kabbalah tradition, I should say. So we looked at the tree of life symbolism of Kabbalah last week and understood, hopefully, how this is connected with the human psyche and human consciousness. It is all about the self. It is knowledge of self. Um, I posted some really nice videos on Kabbalah, very simple, uh, nothing in depth on the website in the podcast section, uh, along with some books on Kabbalah. So for people that want to study further, they can go up to my website, they can click onto the podcast tab, and I believe the show last week was show number 42. So that is up on the site. And there is a, a host of documents up there uh, for your uh, perusal and download. Um, and you could uh, throw them on any kind of a digital reader or read them on your computer and learn more about the Kabbalistic tradition. Um, there's also some movies that are very simple on what Kabbalah is, what it can do for you. Uh, basic, basic material. Uh, very introductory. Okay, for the, the student who is just beginning, the, uh, the new initiate, so to speak. Okay, uh, I would uh, hope that people will avail themselves of this information and study it further because it is a powerful and rich tradition if it is understood in the proper light and used in the right ways. So that's what this is all about on the show. Knowledge is simply a means. Uh, what we do with it is what really matters. Okay, that's what true wisdom is all about. And um, uh, this information can be used for great good or great evil. It, it depends upon the consciousness of the wielder of said information. And I will continue to repeat that theme ad infinitum on this show because uh, we have to understand what the occult is in a much more mature way. And I think that we need to expose it further and further and further and take this into uh, the realm where it becomes truly widespread and distributed, distributed information. That is the only way I think we're going to lead to anything in our uh, world that resemble, resembles true freedom in any way. When the occult is no longer hidden, when it, when it is no longer the occult anymore, when it becomes common sense. That is my contention, and that is why I do this show. So... With that in mind, let's look at one of the oldest and most sacred tradition regarding self-knowledge and regarding the forces at work both within the individual unit of consciousness, the soul, so to speak, what some occult philosophers have called the monad or the individual unit of self-awareness of consciousness and how that relates to the forces that are at work in nature in the macrocosmic realm in the universe and that's what the tarot really teaches us if we are receptive to its message if we understand it as something simply more than a deck of cards if we understand it as a book that is really telling us the story of of ourselves and we need to turn inward to study that story and that's what the symbolism of the tarot card simply helps us to do. It is a tool, okay? And it has been referred to, as I said, as the book of life, okay? As the book of truth as well. And we can start to um, look at the imagery of the cards and how rich and detailed they are if you've downloaded the PDF document with the deck. Um, what I want to just do it again I could never possibly possibly just as a caveat to all of this I could never possibly uh, give anyone all of the knowledge of the tarot in no matter how many shows I did it I can only hope to whet someone's appetite to study this further on their own because you can make a lifetime study of the tarot you could because you can make a lifetime study of the self 
Okay, so this is just an introductory primer, and that's all it is intended to be. In no way is this intended to be extensive or thorough or comprehensive. It's an introduction to the tarot, okay? For the student that wants to look further into this and will take it seriously and go deeper and understand that this is a tradition that teaches about the self, they are more than welcome to do so. And I will, uh, as I did with Kabbalah last week, I will post some uh, introductory material on tarot for people that want to look further into it, and that will be posted along with this podcast on the podcast section of my website. So, what is the tarot? The tarot is a deck of cards that tell a story, a tapestry, okay, help us to explore consciousness, as I've said. And they are, these cards are 78 in number in a true tarot deck. 78, okay? There are 22 trump cards, or what is called the major arcana. The ar- arcana is the word for knowledge, okay? It is a Latin word. It means knowledge. Um, this means the major knowledge, okay? Higher knowledge, And what the major arcana represents, or these trump cards, what it represents is the connection between the soul and the universe. So this is the correspondence principle that we've talked about in past weeks. Okay, The hermetic principle of that which is above is like to that which is below, meaning that the universe is self-similar across all scales, okay? That which happens in the microcosmic world, or the, the small, okay, is reflected into the macrocosmic world, or the very large. So that which is taking place at an individual level is reflected outward into society, and that's what our society becomes like, depending on how many people embody that particular modality of consciousness, it's very easy to understand, actually. You know, if you keep putting uh, a certain type of energy into any given system, you will result with more of that kind of energy in that system. Okay, you keep heating a pot of water, you will get hotter water. Okay, you keep adding colder water to an existing pool of water, the overall temperature of the entire pool of water will become colder. It's quite simple if we just apply our minds to try to understand this. Uh, and that is what the the major arcana suit or the the part of the deck called the major arcana is all about. It is about this relationship between microcosm and macrocosm, and that's what I'm going to try to really get the listener to understand with the symbolism that I've posted to the site uh, today. Okay, so. Um, there are four other suits or subdecks within the tarot deck of 78 cards. So on the major arcana, there are 22 cards, okay, 22, okay, and they are numbered 0 through 21. So if you look at the PDF document that I've posted, you will see that I start with a face, uh, uh, a deck face card. This is basically just showing you what the deck that I uh, chose for the symbolism to explain the symbolism is. And it's called the Universal Weight Deck, and it shows you who made this deck, who contributed to it. So uh, this deck is derived from the teachings of uh, A.E. Waite, Arthur Edmund Waite. And um, uh, that's slide one, or page one in this PDF document. Um, Page two is where the major arcana starts, and it starts with card number zero, and then it goes forward to all the way up to card 21, and these cards are uh, numbered in Roman numerals, so hopefully people are somewhat familiar with Roman numerals. Um, I could refer to the page numbers as well if, if Roman numerals confuses people, but uh, that is how they are... Um, that is how they are... Um, uh, arranged on, in the PDF document. Now, the other four subdecks of the tarot are wands, cups, 
swords and pentacles. Wands, cups, swords, and pentacles. Okay? And you will see them below the 21st card. I should say the 22nd, counting the zero card, in, of the major arcana. Wands will start below that, and then you will see cups, and then you will see um, swords, and then you will see pentacles if you're paging through or scrolling through this PDF document. Um, what these four subdecks represent is basically, th this is called the minor arcana. By the way, all four of these decks taken together is called the minor arcana. And these four subdecks represent different qualities of the self. They represent, I'll start with the lowest in energy. See, these decks are actually arranged in energy levels. The major arcana I put at the very beginning of the, um, of the, the document that I uh, assembled because this is the highest deck as far as knowledge and energy goes because this is the deck of the soul and the universal forces that are at work in nature. Okay? So nothing is really higher in consciousness and energy than that. And that's why it's considered the quintessence or the fifth element of the deck, okay? The element that describes the soul and the forces of nature, okay? So that's the highest in power. Going down from that, we have wands, okay? And wands represents the element of fire, fire. And you'll see fire symbolism in the wands as they're drawn, okay? Fire is an alchemical symbol or representation. And what it basically represents in, the, in our lives and uh, in relation to ourselves is our actions, okay? Our actions. This is why it is the highest in power because our actions are what actually work in the physical world higher than anything else, any other force, any other elemental force that changes the material plane Okay? So these four decks represent what goes on in the material plane okay? of, the, of the minor arcana. Fire being the highest in energy, which is wands. Okay? In the regular playing card deck, just as, a, as a, uh, an analog to the tarot, because that is where it is derived, although in a bastardized form, this would be the suit of clubs. So wands corresponds to the suit of clubs in the regular playing card deck. Now, what you will notice immediately is in the regular playing card deck, the entire major arcana has been removed. And that's critical. That is very telling in my estimation because it is showing you that the quintessence is not even considered important. The fifth element, spirit, soul and natural law, which is what the major arcana represents. And it's been removed from the modern playing card deck. Now it's just been made something we play with, okay, instead of something that is taken seriously, interpreted, uh, read as a, uh, uh, an, an allegory about the nature of self and natural law. And uh, that whole part of the deck has been thrown away, except, of course, for the Joker card, okay, which is in uh, correspondence to the Fool card, the first card of the Major Arcana. It's the only card that is kept from the trump cards of the Tarot. So, the, uh, yeah, the correspondence between the playing deck, we only have four um, suits, okay, and that's the suits correspondences to the suits of the minor arcana. So going down to the next level, lower in energy, still important on the material plane, but not as high of a level as actions or wands, we have cups. Cups is below wands in the minor arcana. So the wands, uh, the cups suit represents our emotional qualities. Okay, so while while wands represents the, the, the plane of will or action, okay, cups represents the emotional plane, okay, or 
what is taking place within us, the spirit in which we do things, the spirit in which we take our actions. So the emotional qualities okay, of the self are embodied in the suit of cups. Okay? Now moving downward from there, we see the suit of swords. Okay? So swords represents our intellectual capacities and capabilities. Okay? So swords is our mind. Okay? And what we do with it. Swords is intellect. Okay? And while that's important, what we know, we have to care enough to do something with what we know, and then we have to actually develop the will to act. That's why, that's why um, swords comes even below wands and cups. Okay? So moving downward, one more level, the final, uh, and uh, by the way, let's look at the associations to the playing uh, deck. Um, for, for wands, it was clubs, okay? For cups, it's hearts, of course, because this is the emotional symbol, the heart, okay? For um, swords, it is spades, okay? And then finally, we come to pentacles. This suit is also called discs in some decks, and coins in some other decks, okay? So this is pentacles, coins, or discs, depending on which deck you uh, may have access to. Um, uh, it's called pentacles in the um, weight deck. So this suit corresponds to our resources in the physical world, okay? It's the physical plane. It's what we have as far as innate talents, innate um, propensities or capabilities, things we are seemingly born with or born able to do better than others. Um, it is also our material resources in the physical world. Okay, so it could represent money, physical resources, food, um, ha house, anything like that. Okay, what we have at our disposal to use in a physical sense. That is what the pentacle suit represents. Okay, so as the material plane, this is the lowest in consciousness slash energy, and then we move up from there. Um, however, uh, this, this part of the deck of the minor arcana equates to the diamonds suit in the regular playing card deck. So at the bottom level, physical uh, physical plane, okay, the material plane. Again, this would correspond in Kabbalah to Asiya. We talked about the four worlds of Kabbalah last week. So this part of the uh, minor arcana, the pentacles, would equate with the diamonds in the playing card deck to the material plane or Asiya, the world called Asiya in Kabbalah, the plane of the material realm, okay, the physical world. Above that, we have the suit of swords. Swords is correspondent to the um, spades uh, suit in the regular playing card deck, and this would be the world, uh, the, the world of formation in Kabbalah, and that is um, yet zero, okay. So this is the intellectual realm, okay? This is intellect, all right? Upward from there, we go to cups. This is the emotional plane. Okay? This is hearts in the regular playing card deck. And then in the tradition of Kabbalah, this would be the third world, which is Bria, okay? And above that, the top level, would be wands of the minor arcana, that's the highest energy of that part of the uh, tarot deck. Wands represents fire. It's our actions. Okay, and in the in the um, 
Kabbalistic tradition, this would correspond to Atzalut, okay, which is the archetypal world. So that's the minor arcana. I'm not really going to say too much more than that. Okay, we could also equate them to earth, air, water, and fire. Okay, earth, pentacles, resources, air, intellect, swords. Okay, now we go upward. We get to cups. That's water, emotional qualities, and then up to wands. That's fire, and that's our actions. So here we have the same principle again, thought, emotion, and action, and what we do with what we have and what we know. It's a repeating theme over and over in case, you know, in listening many weeks, we haven't still seen this pattern or connection. And hopefully people see it and understand it deeply by this point if you've been uh, following these podcasts. So that's the minor arcana, and um, you can get into it in depth. There's a whole lot more into it. It connects in with the tradition of astrology and it connects in with different uh, star constellations. It's a very fascinating study, the minor arcana, but that is not what I'm going to focus on here today. Rather, I'm going to focus on the deck that is left out of modern playing cards, the, uh, the analogy to the, um, the tarot in the modern world, the playing card deck. We're going to look at the most important part of the deck and how this relates to the Kabbalistic tradition, which is the major arcana. So let's break down the cards of the major arcana. And again, I'm going to do this in conjunction, in connection with, in correlation to the Kabbalistic tree of life. And as we said toward the end of the show last week, um, there are really two different Kabbalistic trees when we study this in conjunction with the tarot. And they are what is called the microcosmic tree of life. Okay? And this is the tree that describes the qualities of the self, the individual, the individuation of universal consciousness, the monad, as it is called in different occult schools of thought. Okay? The, the single unit, okay, the microcosm, the soul, all right? Then we can look at this tree, quote-unquote, this arrangement of cards in conjunction with the macrocosmic tree of life, which is the universal forces of nature, okay? And that's what we're going to attempt an endeavor to do here is see these cards in their relationship with another tradition. So we're building correspondences here. And this is what all occultism really does. See, the left brain must step aside in the study of any of these schools of thought. This is why the scientifically minded have so much of a problem with the occult. This is why people will insist that this is another religion and it has nothing to do with religion. Zero to do with religion. Okay? The other thing people will say is, I don't want to study this or look into this or understand this because I don't believe in that. This has nothing to do with beliefs either. This has to do with knowing oneself. And that's all the occult has ever been about. That's all the mystery traditions have ever been about. But in, if someone has fallen in consciousness and yet has a whole lot of knowledge about self, if they've fallen into the dynamic of fear, the energy of fear, okay? If they've fallen into fear-based consciousness, meaning that they are afraid of lack, of not having, they are obsessed with the physical world, Okay, they have become reptilian in their brain because they, they are living from the lowest brain structure, the R complex of the brain, the reptile brain. Okay? And they're constantly in fear of what may happen to them in the physical world, and therefore they want to take, they want to hoard. They want, they want to have at the expense of other people not having. They want to create dichotomy. They want to create schism. They want to have haves and have nots, which is where we're at in the world that we live in. All right? When this kind of a consciousness gets hold of information like this, 
they will hoard it and they will use it as a weapon against people who may not be as aware as they are about how the, the, the nature of the psyche works, about how the mind itself works. And then they will twist it, pervert it, and use it as a weapon. And that's what the dark elements of occultism are. That's what they are and that's what they have done. And we need, again, I, I'll say this repeatedly, we need to be more mature in our understanding of what the occult is. It's simply hidden knowledge, and we need to understand it is how it is used. Too many people paint with a broad brush about this and say it's all negative, it's all bad. Nonsense. The reason that, there are, that dominators want people to think that, that have a vested interest, like religions, have a vested interest in having people think that is so you never understand the hidden knowledge that they do about how you work. And therefore, you can be manipulated like a puppet by the people that do have this knowledge. And that's it, period. Accept that or don't accept it, but that's the truth. So... The idea that I don't believe in this stuff, right? I've responded to this before as well. You don't need to believe in it. Other people understand this information and are using it whether you believe in it or not. If you understand how a law works and how you may manipulate that law to your advantage and other people do not understand how those laws work, they're powerless to defend themselves against you who are at a much higher level of knowledge than they are, dwelling in ignorance. And, you know, pound your fists against the desk or against the wall all you want about that. That's never going to be any different, and you don't need to believe in it for this to be in effect an operation. And to, to take that kind of an attitude is the attitude of a child that doesn't want to believe that something exists and has an effect upon their life. It's, it's, it's the child who refuses to accept that one plus one equals two and wants it to equal three because they want one more of what they, have, they don't have, okay? And is pounding their, their fist on the desk like a little, little child saying, why can't one plus one equal three? Be there is no answer to that. It simply doesn't. That's how it is. So, uh, you know, for, for people that, don't want to accept that the occult has any influence in their life, just, you know, click the stop button or the pause button or the mute button right now and go and turn the television on and enjoy being uh, dominated and then eventually exterminated by the dark occultists of this world because that's the only thing that's on its way. So for those who do want to go further and understand how these principles work and how they've been manipulated... Let's begin the delving into the major arcana, the higher knowledge of the tarot. Now, just before we do this, let's look at the word tarot itself, okay? Tarot essentially is, it, it's derived from the word for the, the goddess, okay? This is, tarot is a sacred feminine tradition, okay? It is a tradition that relates to the generative principle of nature, which ultimately is true care. So this tradition ultimately goes back to goddess worship, the goddess traditions that predate all the mystery traditions, okay? Because it, it's, it's about the nature of, of creation and creation has been seen as a feminine force because the universe came out of the void nothingness okay babies come out of the womb we all come out of the womb the waters of our mother the cosmic mother of the galaxy gives birth to the stars and the solar systems that in which life inhabits and you know, we have a chance to uh, come into incarnation in the physical world and learn. So this goes back to ancient goddess traditions. And the oldest name, one of the oldest names in recorded history 
in the goddess tradition comes from the Far East, the goddess Tara. Okay, a very similar in pronunciation. Okay, same basic phonetic roots, Tara. And that's spelled T-A-R-A, for those that want to look into this goddess. She was a goddess of compassion, mercy, nurturing. Okay? It is all about the generative principle, which we've talked about. What is the prime generator of our experience? It is that which we care about. It is that which we focus our attention on and that which we care enough about to take action in the physical plane to accomplish. Okay, So that's what gives birth to the will, is the heart, care. All right, So that is where the name Tara really comes from. This goddess, Tara, has many different incarnations. Okay, In the Egyptian tradition, she is Isis or Hathor, or Maat, okay? or Ta'ut, she was called in older Egyptian tradition, Ta'ut, T-A-U-R-T, Ta'ut. Now, in other uh, traditions in the, the Middle East, her name phonetically morphed and became, instead of Ta'ut with a U-R-T, we have a reversal, and it became Ta'ut, or with a soft T sound at the end, Ta'ut, Ta'ruth, Ta'ruth. A Ruth is another name associated with this goddess, Ta'ruth. And you can hear the similarity there to our English word, truth. Taruth. Taruth. Truth. Okay, it's just a blending. It's the same basic phonetic variant blended. So this is why this is called the Book of Truth. It's the Book of Taruth. The Book of Tara. The Book of the Goddess. It's ultimately the Book of Care. All right? And that is why it is referred to as the book of life. Because ultimately, if we do not understand the generative principle of care, we don't understand life. Period. That's it. So, with that in mind about the root, the phonetic root of where the word tarot comes from, and we will see this goddess in the deck, visually depicted in the symbology, um, let's look at the major arcana. And I'm going to do one more aside before we jump into that and talk about what most people think the tarot is and what it is not. What it is and what it is not. Or I should say, give people a wider understanding of what it is because they, they seem to think that this is all about fortune telling. Okay, So I would be remiss if I didn't even just at least cover the concept of fortune telling or divination, as it is called, the, the attempt to predict the future through different uh, reading of different symbols. Okay, um, Divination is one of the uses, the uses of the tarot deck. However, to, and you can use it that way, and I, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't particularly have any problem with the tarot being used that way. However, I think that this is a lesser usage. It, it can definitely work like that and help us to get in touch with our intuitive capacities to help us understand the direction that things, the different courses of events may be headed in our lives or in the world. Absolutely, the symbolism can do that. But I think that that is an even lesser um, uh, goal of the tarot. It is uh, one of the lesser intents for which the tarot was originally intended to be used. Another thing we could just briefly touch on is um, the origin of the tarot, which I'll get to in a minute. But um, the original uses, uh, the, the major use of the tarot is not for divination or fortune, fortune telling. It is for getting in touch with the self, okay? Understanding the self better through the interpretation of the allegorical symbols 
that are contained on the cards. And the reason that this was done is because in the past, you had to tell it in, in coded because, you know, ruthless barbarian rulers of ancient times would have killed people, beheaded them, burned them at the stake, etc., and all kinds of torture, put them on the rack for even daring to express this knowledge verbally or in a written form. So, in order to circumvent their uh, barbaric mindset, they would encode the, the story that they were actually telling, an oral tradition story, okay, into symbols, which as we say, the, the, the phrase symbols, uh, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a symbol is worth a thousand pictures because there's so much contained within these rich tapestry of symbols that you could spend, you know, a, you know, a day discussing just the symbolism of one card, let alone the entire deck. It is a book. It is not just a deck of cards. It is literally an entire book. You know, that you can read into repeatedly and in, in extreme depth if you are inclined to do so. Um, and so that, that's the original intent of the tarot. That's why it was encoded into imagery. And uh, the origin. People say, okay, this is derived only from recent times, you know, the, the 14 or 15 or 1600s in Europe. And there's all kinds of... Uh, claims to where the tarot, uh, you know, originated and where the, what the earliest deck is. And the tarot, I'll just say this, and you can look into this and research the origin. The tarot is much older than people uh, give it credit for being. Okay? It is derived from ancient mystery school traditions that date back to the, the ancient Middle East and in, definitely go back into Egypt. Okay? And this was absolutely used in conjunction with the Kabbalistic tradition and I would say it probably predates what we consider the Egyptian civilizations okay I would say this goes right back into ancient antiquity when you know Egypt was referred to as the land of Chem and probably even before that to lost civilizations of which very little uh, recollection let alone records even remain so it is ancient, ancient. I would say it is thousands of years old, not hundreds. Okay? And you will see a lot of Egyptian symbolism in the tarot cards, kind of uh, giving a, 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 you know, a nod or a, a tip of the hat to the Egyptian uh, civilization as being one of the root lands, the, the, the motherlands of where this... Uh, rich symbolic tradition was derived. So, uh, with that having been said about the usage of the tarot and the origins of it, let's look into the major arcana now. Okay, so here we go. And um, um, we'll start with the Fool card, card number zero. So, um, this, is not, this is page number two of the PDF document. Hopefully, people who are listening have had a chance to download it. I hope the server held up well and provided a decent download speed. Uh, the document is only about six megabytes. That's not too bad. I tried to compress it well. The images I st think still look good. Uh, if you don't, uh, if you view them at uh, less than 100%, they they crispen up a little bit and you know look a little bit sharper. Okay, so this is page number two, and this is card number zero of the major arcana. This is called the Fool. Okay? It is an, um, a, a young boy or a young man going off on a quest. He has a, a bag packed on a stick. Okay? He has uh, a flower in his hand. He has a dog, a white dog at his side, and he is stepping off of a cliff. Okay? What this card represents is the journey of the soul. The journey of the soul through the physical plane, through all of the planes, all of the worlds, as we talked about in the Kabbalistic tradition. Okay, but it's 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 journey from the no thing, which is where it begins and ends. That's why it's card zero, the cosmic egg. Okay, this is an archetypal, an archetype symbol. Okay, um, representing infinity. Okay, representing the beginning is the end, 
and the end is the beginning. Okay? It represents no beginning and no end. Okay? They are both joined as one. Infinity. Okay? The unified field. The source of all consciousness. All right? It is a journey, not a destination. So the fool is going on this journey because he doesn't know. That's why he is taking the journey. He is, needs experience. That's why he's referred to as the fool. This isn't necessarily a negative connotation. This is saying this is the whole journey is done for experience and knowledge of self. Okay? The fool ha- carries very little with him. This represents that we can take very little with us into other uh, lives. Okay? But there is some. It's a small amount. This is what I talked about when we talked about nature versus nurture and how there is very little human nature. Okay? We come in with very little specific innate capabilities. But we, certain of us, do. Okay? And they are held over from other incarnations. The flower represents purity, okay, beginning in a pure state. And this is what I've talked about. We don't come in as homicidal murderers. Okay? We come in in a basically pure state, and we are conditioned into the ways that we think through the environmental conditions that are already in place in this world. The dog represents the forces of nature that guide the journey of the soul, but more specifically, it represents the human intuition and the human imagination, the guiding forces of the soul's journey through life. Okay, And you can already see how powerful the symbolism is in these cards. If you're paying any attention, taking any of this to heart, or taking any of it seriously. And scientific types and left brain types will just say, oh, it's all nonsense. Well, go right ahead, continue to believe that, and uh, let yourself be, not understand the, the holistic nature of yourself, live as half a person in the, just the left brain, never make any connection to the, the, the higher consciousness of the right mind, okay? And uh, let yourself be used as a tool, because that's what most people like that are, tools. For other people with horrible intentions, for them and everyone else, that just know more about how the psyche and and these forces work and how to manipulate people. And that's why morons like that, morons like that, will go and build atomic weaponry or hydrogen weaponry for psychopaths. Okay? Yeah, that got, that got you a whole lot. You accomplished a lot with just the pure left brain. And you can say, hey, uh, you, you're, you're, it's harsh the way you, you're wording it. Yeah, it's harsh. Right. I'm not here to make friends with people. Okay? I'm here to explain to people we're heading off a cliff into a ravine and not the one that the fool is headed off because he's going into the abyss of the... the, the uh, universal pool of consciousness is what he's stepping off into, that journey. He's not going over into a a, a fiery abyss uh, of pure destruction, which is what the human race is headed off into, because they won't make that journey that the fool is making. They won't initiate themselves to understand themselves. They want to remain in ignorance and think that they can prosper. And once again, Nothing else to say about that except it doesn't work that way. Why? Because it doesn't. Because there are laws in this realm, and you're bound by them. The end. So people will still insist that that's not the case, and all I can do is acknowledge that there are idiots out there like that, and the word idiot means one who does not know the self. That's what the actual uh, etymology of that word it comes down to. And uh, that's exactly what people like that are, idiots. And uh, again, I'm not here to make friends. I'm, I'm tasked with bringing this knowledge out into the light of day so that people who do want to study it can study it. And I'm going to call uh, that which is the way I see it. And, you know, the, the left brain, the, the left brain imbalance among us 
are never going to get this. They're not going to get this until they suffer enough. And the only thing I can do is wish that that suffering comes to them as quickly as possible and as brutally and bluntly as possible so that they can get over it and get on with understanding. If not, they'll probably choose to uh, not learn and die in this life and uh, you know, not having uh, initiated themselves into this journey and have to do it all over again many, many times, as many times as it takes because they're never getting out of here without confronting this. So, um, the fool's journey is into self. That's what the fool's journey ultimately is toward, a higher understanding of self and higher levels of consciousness. The ultimate goal of the fool is to master the self, the lower level self. Self Self-mastery is what the, the tarot is teaching us. Okay? So, I would like people to refer to image number one on the website if they have access to it, uh, to, to go up there to the radio listen page and look at image number one for tonight's show, which is the microcosmic tree of life. Okay. We started talking about this last week, and I'm going to proceed in order. I'm going to go in actually reverse order okay, of the cards. I'm going to go from the bottom of this tree to the top of the tree in reverse order of the sephirot of the tree of life. The fool, you will see the fool card depicted in the space right below the top of the tree, which is where the magician card, which is card number one in the, in the trump cards, okay, in the major arcana cards, is positioned. Now, the full card is not positioned as one of the sephirot of the tree of life. Okay? It is not one of the sephirot. It is positioned in what is called the realm of da'at. Da'at. Okay? D-A-A-T or D-A-A-T-H. Okay? Depending on how, uh, you know, different, um, different schools of Kabbalah spell it. Uh, transliterated, I should say, from the Hebrew. Um, that is where I am positioning the fool card, and I am coloring it in white. I am putting this outline of this hazy outline of energy. If you're looking at this microcosmic tree of life card, card number one, uh, um, image number one on the website uh, for the uh, images for tonight on the radio listen page. Okay. This white hazy energy represents that this is the realm of the no thing. This is the realm of the hidden, okay? Because the soul forces are initially hidden and have to be discovered by us, okay? And they don't exist in, they don't have their origin in the physical world, okay? They are, that is the realm of hidden knowledge, hidden awareness, it is the, what is really considered the root, the true root of the tree of life from which the tree of life springs. Okay? So this is the no thing. It's non-material. It's non-physical. The tree of life comes out of it as an extension of the spiritual realm. Okay? It's the, the stargate leading to the, the, the realm of pure spirit or pure consciousness, pure awareness. Okay? That is where we're putting the fool card to depict that this card is not one of the ten cards of the microcosmic tree of life itself. Rather, the, the soul, okay, the actual spirit is where this tree comes from. All right? That's why it's positioned there. That's very important to understand. And again, these are all symbols trying to teach an important thing about the nature of the reality in which we live. All right, We have to keep that in mind. This isn't a religion. This is just a tapestry of symbols to teach a lesson, to teach information about what we are doing here what this realm is, and if we're going to change it and make it better, what is required of us. And we need to receive 
that knowledge from the higher self, okay, which is what that realm of Da represents. That's what the whole Kabbalistic tradition is, the process of receiving. That's what the word Kabbalah means. Okay? So, let's start at card number 10, Roman numeral 10, at the bottom of the microcosmic tree. This is what I gave the deck of the tarot cards to the listening audience to refer to. Okay? So, because of the discrepancy of the first two cards, the first card in the um, PDF document being the face card, and then the second being the zero card, which we just talked about, card 10 in the Major Arcana is on page 12. So we're always going to be two pages. The page numbers will always be two pages greater than the card. Okay? Just keep that in mind. All right? So if you go to page 12 on the um, PDF document, you will see card number 10, the Wheel of Fortune. So the Wheel of Fortune represents the material plane. This represents the physical world. It corresponds to, as we see in image number one, on the microcosmic tree of life, Malkut, which we talked about last week being the physical world. It is the world in which we operate. It's the world in which we have to use all of the other forces to make change happen. And it is the realm in which we experience suffering that is proportional to the level of ignorance we exist in. Okay? The level, I should say, of ignorance, apathy, and laziness slash cowardice that we live in. To the extent that those qualities are present in us, we will experience greater suffering. They are inversely proportional. I, I, th- that's directly proportional. Okay? Uh, it, it, the suffering that we experience is inversely to proportional to how much intelligence, care, and will and courage we have. Okay? So as we have more of those, we have less suffering. As we have less of those, we have more suffering. Okay? What is depicted on this card is the wheel of suffering, the wheel of, as it is called in the Buddhist tradition, samsara. Okay? And it is also a reference to us in as to the direction that we need to go if we are to get out of that perpetual cycle of suffering. We have to seek Tara. Okay, that's why the word tarot is on the card. We have to seek the truth. We have to seek the goddess, so to speak. Okay? We have to seek the sacred feminine generative force that is hidden in nature and in our nature in the heart in order to get out of that realm, that cycle of suffering in the physical domain. And that's what this Sphinx represents. He is um, a way shower, so to speak. Okay? He has this sword of truth. And we have to intuitively recognize that there is a pathway to higher consciousness. Know that we're not there. We're not in it. In, in the beginning of our initiative, initiate, uh, yeah. In the beginning of our journey as an initiate, okay? And have a leap of faith that the fool is taking, because that's what that is. It's not a suicide. It's a leap of faith that there is such a thing as truth and that we can understand it. And that is what will help us to get out of identification with the purely physical and material. We see around the outside of the uh, card, the angels of the corners, as it is referred to. The bull represents Taurus. Okay, because these are constellations on the zodiac. This is the great cross. And we see the two crosses depicted in the middle of the Wheel of Fortune. Now, what I'm realizing here is that th- this is the, all of this symbolism, which I think is very important, is probably going to take a little bit longer to describe. We will probably go into a second week on tarot. Hopefully, I can wrap up the microcosmic tree tonight, and then next week we'll look at the macrocosmic tree. I think this is very important, and it really... 
um, will begin to take the listener's mind into uh, understanding symbolism and, and realizing how rich symbolism really is, that it is a language in and of itself, and that we have to become versed in this symbolism. We have to become symbol literate. Okay? It's an entire language that we need to learn because the dominators, the dark occultists of this world are always using this symbolism. All around us, they're using it. And they're using it to subvert human consciousness so that they can continue to get away with what they've been getting away with. And we need to learn this language if we're going to really, truly be able to break out of their mind manipulation. So this is why I'm doing this now. There's a reason. There's always a method to the madness on this show. Okay, I'm doing this in a very specific linear progression that is set up in kind of a left-brained way because the mind has to be taken out of its conditioning in a very specific way. Because if you don't establish building blocks and you start talking about something here way down the road and the, 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 the foundational principles have not been established early on, somebody just listening is going to say, what are you talking about? You know, That's why it's important to listen to the podcasts of this show in order. So new listeners may, you know, find themselves at a disadvantage. You know, maybe they can uh, grasp some of it. You know, if they're, they familiarize themselves with some of these terms and uh, and concepts in, in their own readings or in their own life uh, through different forms of media. However, uh, a, a brand new beginner, you know, probably would want to go and listen to the early podcasts and you know, take the journey from the beginning up to this point. But I'm doing this so that we can get a richer understanding and appreciation of how symbolism works and how it is uh, used, so that when we go into the symbolism section, that will be easier for the listener to, to grasp. Also, I will be really breaking down a lot of occult symbolism in the symbolism section, and that's why I'm doing this now, to basically um, familiarize the, the listeners with a lot of occult symbolism so that will be easier to uh, to grasp when we get to that section okay so back to the uh uh wheel of fortune card okay we have the angels of the corners this is all these are also the gospel writers matthew mark luke and john these are the four archangels michael raphael ariel and uriel okay um these are the uh four elements earth air water and fire okay on and on, the four seasons, uh, spring, summer, fall, and winter, okay? So Taurus is earth, okay? It is the spring season, the midpoint of spring, the middle house of spring in the, in the zodiac, all right? Uh, the the um, uh, lion represents Leo. This is fire, okay? So this is the uh, midpoint of summer, Okay, the eagle represents Scorpio. Uh, Aquila, the eagle constellation, is in near the constellation of Scorpio. So this is fall, and this is water. Okay, and the um, angel represents Aquarius, the water bringer, and this is the midpoint of winter. Okay, so this is air. So again, this is how they relate to the four minor arcana decks. Taurus would be pentacles. Leo would be wands. The, um, the eagle would be uh, cups. And the uh, angel would be swords. Hearing the uh, intro music for this break, we'll be right back on What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Pastor. We'll be right back after this message. We were talking about the um, 
Angels of the Corners. We kind of wrapped up that section, which is the Wheel of Fortune card. Just uh, the important thing to keep in mind with this card, it is that it represents the physical plane. It represents the, the soul journey into the state of incarnation or being born into the physical world. And um, the, it alludes to the pathway out of it being through the Keeper of Truth, which is represented there by the Sphinx, uh, one of the keepers of the, the halls of knowledge, the, the, the halls uh, of records, so to speak, uh, as symbolized in uh, ancient Egypt. Now, on the wheel itself, you will see the name Tarot written as a circle, T-A-R-O, and then back to the original T, okay? Now, again, th this is, there's many things in here, okay? Hidden things, hidden little gems. You'll see the four Hebrew characters, yod He vav He, uh, which is the Tetragrammaton. We talked about that last week in the Kabbalistic tradition. These are references to the four worlds of Kabbalah. These are references to the four elements of nature. These are represent representative of the uh, name of God in Hebrew, which is transliterated as YHVH, Yahweh or Jehovah. Um, we see the two crosses, okay? The two crosses representing the solar cross, or what is known as the cross of the solar system, or the cross of St. George, the uh, straight up and down cross, like a plus sign. And then we see the, uh, the greater cross representing the cross of the galaxy, okay, which uh, is uh, an, a, a reference to these, quote, angels or constellations of the four corners of the zodiac. And uh, that is called, that X-shaped cross is called the cross of St. Andrew. Okay, so um, I will break down the word tarot on this wheel in just a moment, but I see we have a caller uh, on the line, so here we go. Um, continuing, um, on this Wheel of Fortune card, uh, there is the word tarot, T-A-R-O, okay? Now, if we look at the other arrangements of the letters on this wheel, okay, we can see that there is something in it. There is a hidden, uh, a full sentence, not only just words in other languages in it, but there is a full sentence, okay? So the first word that is hidden in this arrangement of letters is rota, R-O-T-A, which is Latin for wheel, wheel, okay? And we see a depiction of the wheel on this card, as we've already referred to. So rota means wheel, okay? So um, the word tarot is in there itself. So the wheel of tarot, okay? What other words or arrangements of words are in here, okay? We see the word T-O-R-A, which is a Hebrew reference, a transliteration of Torah. Torah means law, okay? It's a reference to the first five books of uh, the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay? So this is the Torah and what is considered the law in the uh, Judaic tradition, okay? Um, another word for uh, Torah, another concept that it is connected to is the truth itself, okay? And again, the, the goddess was considered the goddess of truth, justice, and natural law. And her name is, a, is made reference to with T-A-R-O, Taro, which is where that it, the word Taro is derived from Tara, okay? But also her name is hidden in a T O R Ator. Okay? So if we have a hard breath mark at the beginning, we get Hathor. 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 Hathor is a name of the goddess in the Egyptian tradition. Hathor is the goddess of love and care. Okay? So we have another name for the goddess hidden in this arrangement of letters. Okay? We see the word, if we go in the counterclockwise direction, a couple of words appear. One of them is ator, A-T-O-R, and this is a Latin verb that means cultivate, okay? Cultivate or generate, essentially, okay? And we saw this is about the generative principle, the cultivation of care, okay? 
Another word in Latin that we derive from this arrangement of letters, and all of these are in order, these letters. We're not going even across to other letters. We're going in order along the outside of the wheel, okay? O-R-A-T means it speaks. He, she, or it speaks, where we get the word orator from, a speaker, okay? So if we put all of these together, right, we can come up with a sentence that is what the tarot is actually all about, okay? Wheel, R-O-T-A. Tarot, T-A-R-O. The wheel of the tarot, okay? A-T-O-R. Uh, I'm sorry. A-R-O-T, arot is, arot is cultivates, arot. Okay, the wheel of the tarot cultivates. Okay, or it is it acts as a generator. Okay, then we could say orat o r a t it speaks. Right, t o r a Torah the law. Right, a t o r Hathor of Hathor. So the wheel of the tarot cultivates, it speaks the law of Hathor, the goddess. That, that this is an entire sentence arranged within those four letters telling you what the tarot is. Okay? It's a connection that is a circular, a cyclical connection representing the self that is, acts as a connection to the generative principle, okay? A wheel that is a cultivating wheel. And what it ultimately helps us to do is understand the law of nature, of the goddess. It speaks the law of Hathor. That in and of itself, to be able to do that with four letters, is amazing. Okay, and I'll, I'll put a breakdown of that in a slide on the site with the podcast. I hope people um, are looking at some of the uh, images that I post with the podcast as you can go back and download them and listen to these because uh, they help to un understand some of these concepts even better. There's another break coming up. I'll be right back, folks. Okay, we're back on what on earth is happening. Let's uh, move to the next tarot card upward on the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, the, ma the microcosmic Tree of Life. If you're referring to image number one on the site, we are going to now move up to card number, to page number 11 on the PDF document, and this is card number nine, okay? Card number nine, and it's called the Hermit. The Hermit is the initiate who begins to leave the purely physical identified state of consciousness. He knows that he has been dwelling in darkness and illusion, and therefore he sets out as well on a journey to truth with a lamp of knowledge, and inside you'll see the six-pointed blazing star represent, representing the seal of Solomon, which we've extensively talked about on this show in the past as the balance between the left and right brain hemispheres, okay? And that is what the hermit seeks. He knows that he is in a state of spiritual darkness and wants light. That's why he wears a, a darker robe, okay? He is not, his robes are not pure. They're not white. They're gray, okay? Dark or gray, okay? Uh, this is a connection to... Um, uh, uh, look at uh, Gandalf, the, the, the gray wizard in, uh, in uh, Lord of the Rings, who then becomes the white wizard through his process of self-purification after he does battle with his internal demon, which is the Balrock in Lord of the Rings, this demon of smoke and fire. Okay? Um, after doing battle with him and conquering him, which represents the darker aspects of the self he then emerges 
uh, as the White Wizard in the later uh, parts of the, uh, the the trilogy. So the Hermit is the initiate. Okay, he is the one who realizes he has a lot to to, to learn, and he is in darkness but wants to receive. Okay, so this is associated with the desire center. This is the sacrum chakra. Like the Wheel of Fortune card represents Malkut or the base chakra. And you can refer to image number three for a correlation between the tree of life, uh, the sephirot, or the emanations along the tree of life, on the tree of life symbol, and the chakras of the body. Okay, Um so this would be the desire chakra or what is referred to as the, the sacrum chakra in the um, Vedic tradition. Okay? It's called the Swadhisthana chakra. Okay? So that is uh, the sphere of Yasod on the tree of life. Okay? That is foundation. He is establishing a foundation through his desire to learn. He is beginning to root himself in higher levels of awareness. He is now out of Asiya, and this is the first Sephirot in the world called Yetzira, the realm of formation. Okay? Moving upward to the, the cards that are colored yellow. Okay? This is a dualistic chakra or a dualistic emanation along the tree of life. Okay? Because we have to look at these all in conjunction uh, in reference to the middle pillar, okay? So um, this is a twofold aspect of the will center, okay? The, 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 uh, the root chakra connects us with the physical plane. The uh, sacrum chakra, representing Yesod or the hermit, okay, is the desire center of wanting to improve ourselves, wanting to gain more spiritual knowledge. And then we have to apply will, okay? Of course, will has to be tempered by care. This is why the heart chakra is even above that. But the yellow, uh, two yellow cards represent the two dual, the dual nature of the will, okay? And this is an internal manifestation and an external one, okay? So the Internal manifestation is the card to the left there on the pillar of severity, and it is called strength. This is associated with the sephirah known as hod, okay, which we talked about last week. You can always go back to the podcast and refer to these and the images and books. Tons of information to, to, to cross-correlate all of these, okay? But what that card represents is courage, Okay. So this is an internal quality, the, the strength to overcome fear that is within, all right? And uh, that is card number eight. Card number eight, you'll see an, a woman with a lion, and she has an infinity symbol over her head, re- meaning that she is kind of uh, coronated as an illuminate, one who know, does know the self, Okay. Um, she is holding the jaws of a lion closed with her bare hands. Now, <laughs> that's a symbol for courage right there, okay? But it's a symbol that she is conquering her fears. Okay? She is conquering her internal fears. All right? So, courage, the strength card, the sphere of hold on the tree, on the left-hand pillar of severity, Okay? The next card is Sephirot, Sephirah number um, uh, seven on the Tree of Life. And this would be associated with card number seven, okay? It's called the Chariot. And here we see as the secondary aspect of the plane of will, okay, of the, uh, uh, the aspect of will. This is the solar plexus chakra in the Vedic chakra system, okay? It's called the Manipura chakra, all right? Um, this is, this card, the chariot, represents willpower to act in the world, 
So we have internal courage and external willpower, okay, to actually get something done, all right, using the will that exists within us to get something done in the external world, in the physical world. That's why he is the chariot driver, the charioteer, okay? He uses the two forces, okay? The, the feminine force of care and the masculine force of actually, act, actually acting in the world, okay? Represented by these two sphinxes, okay? The, the sacred feminine is the dark one and the sacred masculine is the white one, okay? To actually take action in the world, and that's why he's holding a wand, representing action in the suit of wands, okay? And he is also crowned as an illuminate, as you will see this theme repeated over and over again. It's showing you this is one of the paths to illumination, to what is really meant as enlightenment, acting in the proper moral way. That's what this card represents. That's why it is on the pillar of action, or the pillar of mercy, the right-hand path of the Kabbalistic tree of life. Okay, so again, we could spend a whole show on each card. I, I, I want to move forward because we only have a few moments left uh, and we'll continue this next week, but I'm going to move a little bit faster. Card number six, as we move up to the green, or the middle of the tree of life, the very hub, which is the representative of the heart chakra or the Anahata chakra. Okay, this is the lover's card, of course, because this is about love. This is about true care. Once again, we see the twin forces of male and female represented by Adam and Eve, and they are brought together by higher consciousness or an archangel. I believe that would be the representative of, it would represent the archangel Michael, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it's just basically saying higher forces is what that angel represents, okay? And that's what love puts us into touch with. That's what true care puts us into touch with, all right? So the lover's card associated with the heart chakra, okay? On the tree of life, that would be uh, the sphere of um, Tiferet, which means beauty. And uh, I neglected to mention uh, the sphere called Netzah is what we would associate the chariot with, okay? But uh, Tiferet on the tree of life corresponds to the lover's card. Going forward to Sephirah number five, this is the Hierophant, okay? Um, some decks call this card simply the Pope, okay? The Hierophant represents the aspects that we exercise within ourselves for self-control. Dominion, as I've called it. Bringing the thoughts, emotions, and actions into harmony or unison in an act of our will. So, Controlling our own thoughts, emotions, and actions. The only thing we're really allowed to control. That's the Hierophant card, what he ultimately represents. And you will see that he is crowned. Sovereign. Okay? And you'll see this over and over again. All right? Um, he holds also a form of a wand, because this is about a form of control, but it is the kind of control that we do have a right to exercise because it is taking control over the kingdom of self. And that's why this is called uh, severity or geburah on the tree of life. And this card is blue. It is associated with the throat chakra or the vishuddha chakra. Okay? So, um, hierophant, internal self-control, self-dominion. Okay? Um, and it also represents maintaining control over uh, your, own, your own words and what you are doing with your words since it is associated with the throat chakra. Okay, so it is about what do you use your uh, voice energy to speak into creation? What are you putting out there? Are you speaking the truth? Okay, that's what this card is all about. All right, now the, the next card, card number uh, four, in the major arcana is the emperor and this would be associated also with the throat chakra as this is another dualistic rung on the tree of life okay uh and um this card would be associated with the sphere called um uh hesed which is mercy okay on the 
the pillar of mercy, the, the right-hand pillar on the tree of life. And the emperor represents influencing others, being an influence in the world, okay, through what you know, what you care about, and what you do. How does your life inspire and influence other people? Are you an example, like a good king, okay, setting an example for others on how to live and what to spend your time doing and what to spend your, uh, the resources that you have on and what to do with your mind, etc., and how to use your voice. Okay, so this is the external influence that we exercise upon others around us in whatever way, all right? the emperor. Again, he also has a form of a wand, and he has a globe representing the earth. Uh, and what this really represents is that our actions uh, go beyond us and influence the world. All right? Um, he is also crowned as emperor, okay? Associated with Aries as well, the ram, a fire sign. Okay, it's on the active pillar. So that is the emperor card, and that is, that that completes the throat chakra, the two aspects of the throat chakra: internal self-control and then in, influence of others. Okay, how we um, speak to ourselves to help ourselves uh, move forward in consciousness, uh, and how we speak to others to influence them. Uh, and, you know, do we use that in the capacity of truth? Uh, do we use that to really make a contribution and to leave the world better than we found it? Uh, going up to card number three, the Empress card, okay? Clearly we see that this is associated with the goddess, as is the next card upward. Um, uh, we have the heart uh, and the symbol of Venus itself, the planetary symbol for Venus. Clearly, this is uh, the symbol for Venus. Um, again, crowned with stars because it's one of the uh, planets, uh, again, connected with the stellar cult, the, the uh, astrotheological cult of stars and planets, as we talked about in past weeks. Um, this card is connected with the Sephirah called Binah. Binah means understanding, Okay. So this is simply, and again, this is uh, these two chakras, uh, these two cards in purple here are associated with the third eye chakra, which is the, uh, the uh, Ajna chakra. So the Ajna chakra um, is the empress and the high priestess, which represents the goddess. Um, uh, this is you know, about the realm of knowledge, because we're up uh, at the third eye level of the tree of life. And um, again, the Empress, uh, in being a correspondence to the Sephirah Binah, is simply what we know. Okay, it's an internal quality. That's why it's on the pillar of severity. Going up to card number four, here we see the goddess uh, in the middle of the Temple of Solomon, the three Masonic pillars of Jaquin and Boaz. Okay, um, also representing the tribes of Benjamin and Judah. Okay. Um, with the moon, because she is the moon goddess, the cross on her chest representing the heart um, chakra and also the giving birth to the sun uh, savior on the, the cross of the zodiac. Torah written on the, on the book she is holding because she is the goddess of truth and law, okay, as she is connected with Maat. The tree of life is behind her, you'll notice, and it's uh, depicted as pomegranates and uh, if you checked out the page uh, on my podcast section uh, for last week, I posted a book called A Garden of Pomegranates by the occultist Israel Regardi, which talks about the Tree of Life and Kabbalah in general. Uh, rich symbolism all over the card. Um, this is the goddess of truth. This is Tara herself, okay, uh, depicted in the deck. And she represents the sphere on the tree called Hokmah. Hokmah is um, wisdom because, of course, she is the Logos Sophia, the word of wisdom itself. Okay? Wisdom is what we do with what we know. So this is the active quality. The magician card 
he is crowned, as you see, because he is connected with the concept of the crown or the keter sephirah on the top of the tree of life. He is illuminated. He is covered with white. He may be wearing a red and white robe, but he is completely surrounded by a white glow. This means he has become the illuminated one. Okay? And people think that the word illuminati always means something negative. It does not. There are positive illuminates in the world. Okay? People who do know the self. People who have mastered their internal forces represented by the four um, objects that are uh, placed upon his table under his command, yet he needs not wield them as weapons because now he is connected to the true wand or scepter of power, which he holds in his right hand. This is a, an analog to truth, wisdom, and unity consciousness. Okay, The concept of as above, so below is also depicted. He is connected with the higher self through the wielding of that scepter of power, okay, representing he has conquered himself, the lowercase s self, and he, he rules the kingdom of self. Okay, as we've talked about the concept of dominion, he has dominion over himself, the only thing you're allowed to have control over. He controls his own thoughts, his own emotions, his own actions, and he has brought them into unity. He has brought them into unison with each other, such that he has become a being that as he thinks, so he feels, and so he acts. And there is no contradiction between these three aspects of his consciousness. Okay? So the four elements are under his command. The four elements of the material world is under his command. This is what, in the Christian tradition, Jesus, the words attributed to Jesus in the New Testament, what he said when, he said, when you... Uh, make the eye single, okay? When you, when you make the two into one, okay? When you bring yourself into unity in what he termed the kingdom of heaven, right? That you can say to the mountain, mountain move and the mountain will move. The, the, the command of the forces of nature, of natural law, are on the side of the one who has achieved self-mastery. And this is all about the self. This isn't about serving any other god. This isn't about serve. You know, different dark occult traditions can twist it into that. But I'm trying to teach the pure, original um, uh, uh, tradition of what these cards were originally intended to help the initiate or the student accomplish, which is to know oneself and to come into unity consciousness, to become the ruler of the kingdom of self, uh, just one final word about the magician. You'll see he has one arm pointed up and one arm pointed down. Again, this is a reference to the uh, the principle of correspondence of uh, hermeticism and uh, the idea that the universe is self-similar across scales and that the uh, microcosm is a reflection of the macrocosm or that the very small is a reflection of the very large and vice versa. So um, this is... Uh, also represents that he is plugged in to the energy of higher consciousness and he is bringing it through himself, through his actions in unity consciousness that he actually takes in the physical domain represented by his hand that is pointed down toward the earth. Okay, So uh, when one has achieved this state of self-mastery and understands what their work is here on the ground, uh, they act in this capacity to bring those higher levels of awareness down to others who are also in the physical domain. So it's, uh, it's acting as a conduit, I guess you could say. He's a vehicle for that, the transference of energy from higher states of awareness so that he can uh, uh, help to act as an alchemist, to act as an influence on other people who are still in the material identified state of consciousness in the physical world. And, uh, we need more magicians, folks. We need a lot more magicians. That's all I have to say about that. Again, uh, the, the fool is in the position of Da'at, which is the hidden sphere of knowledge from which the, uh, the tree of life uh, actually emerges. This is the no thing, and we talked about that last week. And the fool in this position represents the soul and spirit itself, uh, as the uh, the source, okay, the connection to the source or the higher 
uh, self. So um, let's look at the macrocosmic tree. This is image number two that we're going to, not on the uh, tarot book, but on the website, the second of the five images that I posted. And you'll notice that it looks very similar, except there are a new set of cards in the positions on the tree of life. And these are cards 11 through 21. Now, the first card of the major arcana is the fool, which we just talked about what that rep represents. And he is in the position of dot. And he was colored white because this is not on the tree of life or considered one of the emanations of the tree of life. But it is uh, from whence the tree of life comes. Okay? Uh, simil similarly, on the macrocosmic tree of life, we take the last card of the major arcana, card number 21. Okay? The very last card, because again, this brings it full circle. The beginning corresponds to the end, and the end corresponds to the beginning, and it works in a cyclical fashion, as we are, go are going to see as a theme throughout occult uh, schools of thought. Okay? Um, and we see the circle again, or the zero, okay, representing the no thing, right? The, the, with this wreath of this card. Now, if you're going to look at this on the tarot document, you're going to skip ahead to what is called Major 21, the Major Arcana 21. That's what the uh, image will be termed on, this, uh, on the, uh, the page of the PDF document. And it is simply called the world. So this is image number 21 in the major arcana, and it is called the world. In some decks, you will see this called the universe. Okay? So this is the, the, the playing field, so to speak. This is the actual physical world that we live in, but it is also the spiritual world. There are no real separations between those things. Okay? People have termed this the body of God, the unified field. Um, the all, it doesn't make a difference what you call it. It is the micro, it is the macrocosm itself. Okay, it is the all. Okay, so again, it is here depicted with this goddess figure that we saw on card number two. But this is um, this is the, the the womb of creation. Okay, so it represents the void itself. You know, the all springs from the void or the no thing. It's not really physical. We talked about that when we talked about uh, physical, worldly identification of, through matter. How people get so left brain identified that they are, they are purely identified with the physical world only. But this world is anything but solid. We looked at some uh, aspects of, um, of uh, uh, quantum mechanics when we looked into the section on uh, ego identification and identification with materialism. I called that section of, my, of, uh, of um, understanding the, the, the understanding of the barriers to the realization of the true self. And that was many, many weeks back. But again, you can go back in the podcast and check that out. Uh, the, these barriers to self-realization included something I called five sense illusion. Okay, identification with purely material um, physical reality. And if we look at the uh, particles that comprise the physical reality, they're nothing, nothing but solid. Uh, they're not solid at all. They're actually pure energy in, vi in a state of vibration. That's all it is. It's condensed to a lower state of vibration, and we call that physical matter. But uh, what this card is basically telling us symbolically is that Really, there is no material world per se, okay? It's all a spiritual construct. It's a construct that we experience through mind, okay, like a lens. And it's therefore experience and learning and growth, okay? And that's what this uh, goddess figure that represents the pure potentiality, okay, of everything um, represents. And you see then that's brought into, she's in that, doorway, which is represented by this wreath, okay, that's in the form of a zero, just like the fool card was card zero. This is a, a correlation to that card. The, the as above, so below, or the correspondence principle brought here again, because uh, the soul and the universe are essentially one, and they are reflections of each other. 
the microcosm reflects the macrocosm and vice versa. So we see the angels of the corners, as we described last week, the lion, man, bull, and eagle, representing Aquarius, uh, uh, I'm sorry, representing Leo, Aquarius, uh, Taurus, and Scorpio, the, um, the um, ruling houses of the quadrants of the zodiac, uh, the ruling houses of each pr- uh, respective season, um, um, summer, um, summer, spring, uh, fall, and winter. And um, these are the arms of what is called the Great Cross of the galaxy. And again, the galaxy is also connected, as we saw when we looked at the astrotheological traditions, particularly when we looked at the Islamic tradition and its connection to astrotheological um, uh, concepts and worship, was uh, the, the, the galaxy is connected to the goddess, which is the goddess of pure potential and the void. So we have all of these connections brought back on this card, uh, representing our position in the galaxy, representing um, the, the void of nothingness from which the material reality ultimately springs, because it's all energy in a state of manifestation that is derived from pure potential. Okay, And sh- she has two wands of power, or two uh, forces, because this goddess is the bridge between the microcosm and the macrocosm. Okay, she ultimately is the one that is in control. If you want to look at it that way, this is these are the forces of nature itself. This is the goddess that represents natural law. The 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 governing forces of our reality that you're not going to break and get away with. Period. You're bound by them. The end. We've talked about this innumerable times throughout the shows, and I'll continue to mention it, but there are still people who don't believe there's any such thing as natural law principles that believe that they can do whatever they want in this reality and get away with, and they're delusional people. Um, Natural law is always in effect, always has been in effect, always will be in effect. You're bound by it forever and ever, the end. Um, Good luck thinking otherwise. That's why, that's why suffering exists, ladies and gentlemen. Suffering is, exists because the people in this world who think that they're God and think that they own and control these forces, which they don't, uh, refuse to acknowledge their existence and refuse to acknowledge that they're bound by these laws. Nonetheless, that happens to be the truth. They are. We can come to understand these forces and work in harmony with them, or we can continue to flaunt them, continue to ignore them, in which case we're going to continue to suffer endlessly. The end. Get over it as fast as you possibly can. Okay? That's it. And, you know, I'm not going to even belabor that point because I've talked about it endlessly on the show. Go back and listen to some podcasts where I talk about natural law and even podcast number 36 in which I break it down in in a presentation. So um, this goddess represents the forces of natural law, okay? And that's what the world is governed by. And these laws are not derived from simply the physical. Again, that's why the the zero symbol is there, okay, representing that uh, these are derived from the realm of potential or the realm, the spiritual realm. They're not, you can't see them by studying just the physical world. You have to have a more holistic, all-encompassing worldview in order to discover these laws. You're never going to discover them just in left brain, logical, analytical science. Okay? You need the wisdom of the right brain hemisphere, the sacred feminine, which is a, an analog to the goddess herself, uh, a, a, a bringer of higher uh, aspects of consciousness through the nurturing forces, through this, the, the, uh, the emotional qualities of the self, and you need to bridge that with the analytical and logical qualities of the left brain. That, that, those can't be thrown out, those masculine forces. They need to be bridged and combined into a synthesis with the qualities of the right brain. And that's why she holds these two scepters of power, okay, which uh, she is this bridge between these masculine and feminine forces. She controls the whole game. It is natural law. 
You can look at that as a feminine nurturing mother, not a, not a strict disciplinarian or a vicious, uh, you know, uh, control freak or anything like that, because these laws are not put into effect as a prison. They are put into effect as a guide, as guidelines on how to conduct ourselves and to reach self-mastery so we do not have to experience suffering, and this realm can become the paradise that it was intended to be. Okay, so let's start the breakdown of this tree, and uh, this goddess or this world card is put into the position of Doth again as the, the hidden sphere on the Sephirotic tree to represent that this is where it ultimately all comes from, okay, and goes to. It's a flow in a circle represented by that wreath around this goddess figure, okay, and that's my best attempt at a breakdown of the world card. So let's build it up as we've done in the microcosmic tree from the base, from the Malkut position. And again, if you need a reference to these, these words, you can go back to the images of the, uh, the, the uh, tree of life in the Kabbalah section. You can bring those images up on the website. Okay? Th again, this is a, uh, a building block uh, form of study and teaching. You have to grasp the concepts and some of the jargon uh, in a previous teachings and study, and then we are going to continue to use that as we go forward. So again, this is a stepwise progression. That's what we have to understand. That's what initiation is. Initiation is taking these building blocks and then stacking them, and then stacking them, and stacking them, just like you build a building. And this is how we build an understanding, a deep understanding of self. And that's all these symbols are for, ladies and gentlemen. We can't build them into something that they're not. It's not a religion. It's not a belief system. It's a tool. That's it. It's a tool. Symbols are ultimately tools. Now, they do have an effect upon our, our subconscious and conscious minds. But you know what? They do that more so if we're completely ignorant to the language of symbolism. Once we understand and become symbol literate, we can understand how symbols in any given position or aspect are being used. That's the key to their true decoding. Okay, Not just looking at the symbol itself and saying, oh, that always represents this. No. A symbol may be used in one place to represent something, and then it can be used in a different place and represent something altogether different, depending on who's using it and for what reason. We need a more mature understanding of the language of symbolism. I can't stress this enough. And too many people in the so-called freedom movement who think all the occult is negative, it's all horrible, it's all of the devil, it's all, you know, satanic, do not understand because they have not really initiated themselves into this rich language of symbolism and these teachings. And they do not understand that these can be applied for, to be a force of great good. And I'm sorry, but I, I, I'm never going to admit or acknowledge that some of what these people are saying, that it's all negative and it's just all trying to put spin on something that's evil, that's not the case. This is a child's interpretation of something that they know very little about. Okay? And you'll know who I'm talking about, and you can, you can go out and look at all different kinds of researchers that, that talk about this as purely being negative. Okay? Now, knowing what I've come forward and said on this show about human freedom, do you think I would come and start to teach a tradition that is purely negative and can only be used for ill? Of course not. Okay? I'm, I'm trying to help people gain a more holistic understanding of what the occult really is and what it's really used for in its pure form and what it is being used for in its adulterated form. Okay? Because there's a world of difference between those two usages. And again, I think we need to grow up and we need to be a little bit ma ma more mature about this. Okay? So with that having been said, let's break down this macrocosmic tree now. Okay? In the Malkut position, which is the very bottom of the tree, okay? for the people who haven't yet, I guess, mastered the jargon, and again, these are just Hebrew terms from way back that relate to concepts, that's all. Don't get caught up in the jargon, okay? 
we're looking at the very bottom or the base of the tree along the middle pillar, okay? Uh, that's depicted there in red on image number one, uh, on image number two, I'm sorry, okay? So this is the judgment card. And if we look, at, if you're following along with the PDF document, um, you go to the judgment card. This is card number 20. That's in Roman numerals, two X's, okay? And it says judgment on the bottom. It's an angel with a trumpet blowing the trumpet. The trumpet has a cross attached to it. And the, there is a man, a woman, and a child rising from sarcophagus, uh, from, from sarcophagi, the plural of sarcophagus, okay? They're rising from tombs. Let's just call it to be simple, okay? And this represents the call out of purely material identified consciousness, okay? From base, mundane, material world is all there is, state of awareness. That's what this represents. That's why it is in the Malkut position in this uh, ordering of these cards, okay? Now, again, these are the forces of nature, that are at work. These are all natural law principles and forces. We have a choice whether to go along with this calling. This is a, a wake-up call. That's what this card represents. A wake-up out of base consciousness. And that's why it is the very bottom of the tree. You can't really do much of anything or make any movement upward in consciousness until you at least hear and begin the process of responding to this call which is the initiate's journey, okay, toward higher spiritual understanding. That's what this card ultimately represents. The cross is a symbol of crossing over to something new, a bridge. You cross a bridge, okay? You go through a gate. You make a crossing. It's a journey from one paradigm or one worldview, one way of seeing the world to another way of seeing it, Okay? That's why the cross there depicted with the horn that is a vibratory energy. Some researchers like David Icke have called this truth vibrations. And I love the term. I love the concept. I love the way he describes it. You should read his book, Truth Vibrations. It's fantastic. His first uh, book that he put out uh, after his wake up to this form of uh, vibratory consciousness. Okay? Uh, great person. Uh, it it, unimaginable level of courage to do what he does and stick with it through all of the ridicule he's gotten over the years. He's, he's one of the people I consider an, in, an influence and, a, and an inspiration because of his courage to speak his mind regardless of what anyone thinks of him. And I'd like to think that I go in, in those footsteps, so to speak, because I don't care what anybody thinks of what I say and talk about. You know, I'm going to speak it, period. So, this is what the judgment card is about. And it's not a negative card just because it says judgment. It's, it's the beginning of our exercising judgment of wanting to know the truth. Okay? If we don't do that, then it can be seen as a negative card because then we are going to experience the judgment of natural law when we ignore it, refuse to uh, come into understanding and cooperation with it. Again, two, two meanings. A lot of times symbols have dual meanings. So, again, we go along with this wake-up call, we exercise positive judgment, we can rise up from our state of being dead, okay, spiritually. And, again, this is what the dark occultists call us. They call us the dead as a, as a whole. That's what they refer to the mass of humanity as, the dead. Wonderful, wonderful people, okay? Um, and they do this because they say if you're in a state where your thoughts, emotions, and actions aren't in unison, okay, if you're a, an ignorant person, if you're an apathetic person, if you're a lazy person or, and a coward, you're essentially dead. All of the soul qualities are dead, and so you're dead. You're in, you're in a, a coffin. You're in a sarcophagus. You're completely dead. You're identified with the material realm. You can be conditioned. You can be manipulated. You can be put into a state of hypnosis and trance at will and you know, put on strings like a puppet, and, uh, you know, they own, they own you when you're in that state. You're, you're a complete slave to their form of, uh, of dark manipulation in consciousness, and that's why they call people like that the dead, 
and I 100% concur that they are dead. I'm, I think it's a horrendous thing. I think I'm, I get angry when I even think that people are that wicked, that they talk about living beings like that. But is it true? Absolutely it's true. Hard thing to admit. I didn't want to admit it for years of my life. But I, I can say when I'm wrong. And this is the, 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 the real state of humanity isn't people waking up with their arms out to this call. This is a, po- a more positive interpretation of this card. Most people are lying in that coffin with the lid closed. Okay? That's not me being negative. That's just the truth. That's just how it is right now. It's our goal to help to sound that alarm, which is what the angelic force is doing as a wake-up call to come out of this completely deadened state of awareness. Okay, so I hope that helps to clarify the symbolism and deeper meaning of that card. And again, these are my deeper interpretations of, of these cards based upon my study and my initiation into the occult. And it, it's a very holistic and um, uh, integral interpretation Okay, from many different traditions and points of view and, and um, um, uh, perspectives. So I, I want to help the audience to keep that in mind. There will be other interpretations of these symbols. Uh, you should, you should uh, engage them all because no one's word is final on any of this. This is an exploration and study of the self that's infinite. Okay? The universe is infinite and so is the soul, so is the spirit, and so a study of these cards is infinite. All right? Just that to say that as a caveat uh, to the further study of this tradition. All right? So let's move to position number nine on the, uh, the Sephirotic tree, which is the sphere of Yesod, okay? And that's the foundation card, okay? Malkuth, of course, the red uh, judgment card, that position, that re- represents what's called kingdom. Malkuth, that's what it means. We go up one to this orange card. It's called the sun, okay? And again, this would be the equivalent of the, uh, not the base chakra. The base chakra is that judgment card. That's Malkuth. We go up one to the sacrum chakra, okay? This would be the, some people call it the genital chakra, okay? The sacrum is the desire center, Okay, so that's what the sphere of Yesod, or foundation on the tree of life, represents. Okay, and this is the sun. So this is the force that is calling us up out of that base level of consciousness. Okay, this is the light. Okay, the force of light calling us up out of that pure material identified consciousness. Okay, and again, we see it is the symbol of the sun. Okay, we saw how this is connected with the Christian tradition. We saw how the sun was connected with the Christian tradition in astrotheology. It's a solar sect of astrotheology. The moon, which is the next card, which we'll get to in a moment, was the Islamic tradition, okay, the lunar sect of astrotheology. The star was the Judaic religion. That was the stellar cult or the stellar sect of astrotheology. The, the, the cult of the stars and the planets, the, the, the lesser lights of the heavens, the smaller lights of the heavens. So these three cards actually act in conjunction with each other in this triangle when we, we saw how that relates to the worlds of the Kabbalah. This lower triangle represents Yetzira. Yetzira is the, forma- the world of formation. And again, these are the formed objects that represent the... Uh, the, the, the heavenly bodies that comprise the material world, okay? It's the, 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 the stars, the planets, the moon, etc., okay? These are all of the heavenly bodies on which uh, life depends and on which life lives in, in the cosmos, okay? So we see that this corresponds with the formative world known as Yetzirah in Kabbalah, this, these, this triangle formed by the next three cards, the sun, the moon, and the star. The, the sun in particular okay, represents the force that is calling us up, the light calling us upward out of that base level of consciousness represented by uh, the, the Malkuth or judgment card. Okay? 
So this is desire. We need desire to move forward. Okay, that's connected with the um, sacrum chakra, okay, or the planet Jupiter, as we saw when we looked at the uh, the connection to the uh, tradition of the, the Vedic chakras when we put when we superimpose a solar system with our solar system with the pl- planetary attributions on each chakra site. Again, this is all a connected tapestry, and I would highly encourage people to go back and. Uh, l- listen to the podcast and work with the imagery. That's its key. Contemplate it. Understand its deeper meaning and its deeper message to the self. Okay, through the self. All of this imagery should be contemplated on. Don't just look at it once or just you know dismiss it or uh, you know give it a cursory examination. The best thing to do is actually get a deck of these cards, lay them in these positions. Uh, and work with them in a, in a mode of contemplation. And I guarantee you, insight will stream in, okay, if, if you're really taking it seriously. And it will help you to understand better things that are really going on within. And again, that's what this is all ultimately about, ladies and gentlemen, okay? So the sun card, okay, um, that's what's, again... Uh, pulling up, pulling us up. It's it's what the angel is working on behalf of, really, the light, okay, the forces of light. Now, the moon and the star are in the uh, solar plexus chakra position. Now, on the tree of life, these are the spheres of Hod and Netzah, okay? So Hod on the left, which is the pillar of severity, and Netzah on the right, the pillar of mercy. So we have an in- Internal aspect and an external aspect of will, of light, okay, of the forces of evolution calling us upward out of base consciousness, which is represented by Malkuth. And this is saying that we need to activate the will. These cards are in the will center positions, the solar plexus chakra, and therefore they're colored yellow, okay? So the moon represents that we need to have. We need to connect, okay, with the higher forces that help us to develop courage, okay? And one of the the properties that enables that is getting in touch with the sacred feminine force within us or the right brain aspect, okay? And again, that's what this left-hand pillar, the pillar of Boaz or the, the black or dark pillar, ultimately represents these are all the internal sacred feminine yin forces of consciousness okay indwelling now this is what the lunar principle is all about and hence the moon is on that pillar of severity okay corresponding to that but acting in the complementary or some would say the dualistic role because this is a dualistic chakra center that has two basic principles courage and will, is the star card, okay? So the star card is on the active side, and it's shown this would be connected with the concept of the water bringer. You see this uh, water bringer pouring water out into a, 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 a lake or a stream and has one foot in the waters, one foot on land. This is, again, bridging the material and the spiritual worlds, okay? This is telling us, yes, while we need to develop courage within and while we need to use the spiritual principles that we don't actively see in the physical plane, we need to do that work on the ground. Okay? So this is about taking action. It's the solar plexus center. Okay? It's about courage and will. And that's what this star card in this position is basically symbolic of, that we need to keep you know, one foot in the spiritual plane, one foot in the physical plane, okay? We need to be in this world, but not of it. And the work that needs to be done here needs to be done on the ground, on the game board floor, so to speak, which is the material plane. We can't get caught up in this idea that because we understand that our true nature doesn't lie in the physical world, that there's nothing to do here. That's nonsense. This is a cop-out. Okay, this is a cop out of the right brained imbalanced, or you know what I just generally refer to as the new age, the new agers that have uh, 
you know, uh, gone too much into a state of right brain imbalance, all right? Thinking that there's nothing to be done here because they don't identify anymore with the physical world. Nonsense, okay? We need to make that connection to the, the spiritual realm, but understand that there is work to be done here in the physical plane. And that's what we are tasked to do, to change the manifestations on the physical plane, because the physical plane isn't really separate from the spiritual plane. Okay, it's just that same energy condensed to a lower vibration so that, uh, so that uh, experience may be had and knowledge can be gained and growth uh, and progress can be, can be made. As we move toward higher and higher levels of awareness, moving back toward uh, true unity with the all. Now, this star card, again, represents that understanding that we need to be rooted in both worlds. We need to act as a bridge between both worlds and how important it is that there is actual action that needs to be taken in the physical domain, that we cannot ignore that, okay? So that's what we're talking about now, the yang forces at work, okay? So this is the, the male aspect of the, the, the natural law forces of creation, Okay? And again, that's why this is on the male pillar or the pillar of mercy, as it is called in Kabbalah. Okay, so it would be the sphere of Netzah, okay, which means victory. Okay, the sphere of Hod, the moon card, means splendor. Okay. Now we move up now to the tower card, colored in green, because again, this is associated with the heart chakra. It is the balance point of the tree of life. We talked about the color green being the middle of the visible spectrum, being the balanced color of nature, being the color of the heart chakra, the Anahata chakra in the Vedic tradition. Okay? This card in the macrocosmic sense, the tower, represents the force of change. And the universe is change. That's why it is a hub. It is the central hub of the macrocosmic tree. Everything is in a state of change at all times. This is what the universe means. The word universe means the one change. It comes from uni in Latin, a prefix which means one. Okay? Unity, bring to oneness. Okay? Unison, etc., etc. Okay? It means one, uni. Okay? And versare. The verb versari in Latin means to change. And there are people who, you know, want to belabor this point saying, okay, you look it up in a Latin dictionary, it says to turn. Well, it doesn't mean to physically turn. It means to turn in the sense that leaves turn into another color in the fall. They change colors. To, the seasons turn from one to the other like a wheel, okay? And that's what it represents, Okay, change is what Versari ultimately means. The universe is the one thing that is constantly changing in a state of dynamic flux. That's what the word actually means when we break it into its etymological constituent elements. Okay? This tower card often represents sudden change. We see the crown being blown off the tower, the people you know, falling out of it, it being on fire again. You could see the correspondences here to 9-11. We'll talk about this card when we get into the symb symbology of the 9-11 event. But what this card represents ultimately in this macrocosmic sense, according to the forces of nature, is that the forces of nature are ultimately governed by the principles of change. And we cannot stay in a state of consciousness that doesn't want to accept change, that wants to always keep things in a uh, seeking to keep things in a steady state. We're, we're going to experience suffering if that's the case. Things are always changing, and our minds have to be fluid and go along with that change. Otherwise, we're going to be like the oak tree in the wind that snaps when the wind gets too powerful. Okay, We need to be fluid and be willing to bend with the forces of nature as they are coming in and affecting uh, our consciousness. And that's what we're really experiencing right now. The, there is a different vibratory state that is attempting to come in here and change things, and there's so much resistance to, by the people of this planet 
that don't want to change because so many of them have vested interests in the way things are and they've been running the show and they've been controlling things and they don't want anything to change. They don't want thing, things to become different or more egalitarian or um, you know, uh, more free. They like it in the controlled state that it is right now and have no problem with it continuing on like that into the foreseeable future. Okay, But ultimately, the people who are serving that force, that dark force, are going to snap like the oak tree snaps in a tremendous wind. There is no stopping this force. The, the, the higher will of the universe is going to see its will done regardless of what we want or any of us want here. That's what people have to understand about this. Everybody's going to ultimately get this. You don't really have the choice. So if you want to look at it in the highest aspect of it, free will, yes, you could say is an illusion. The only thing that how free will really applies is how much will you either cooperate with that force that's ultimately in control of this whole game or how much will you try to go against it? In which case, you'll create an, an enormity of suffering for yourself. If you happen to step into that slipstream, that flow of energy, the, the world can become like a paradise because you're getting the lesson that is intended by ultimately the higher will, which you can call it whatever you want, the unified field, the, uh, the uh, dynamic intelligence that underlies all creation. You can call it God. I don't care what you call it. Okay? But you're not going against that force and ultimately winning. And the problem is the bulk of humanity is going against that force and somehow we think we're going to escape unscathed. How I describe this force of change uh, that's represented by this tower card, um, imagine that uh, the, the, the forces at work in the universe are like um, uh, a hand, okay? And they're attempting to guide and shape, uh, let's say, a huge uh, aspect of uh, a huge um, amount of clay, okay? You remember, um, uh, this is a nice uh, anecdote that helps explain this concept. You remember uh, Silly Putty or um, uh, what do they call it? Play-Doh, right? Play-Doh, everybody played with this uh, stuff when they were young. Different colors of, of uh, you know, uh, soft clay you can mold and they, you had molds for it. You could press it through things. You can make spaghetti. You can make shapes. Everybody played with this, at least people, you know, kids that... Uh, I guess grew up in the same era as I did, who are probably in their mid-30s now, you had this stuff when you were young. You, you definitely had to, okay? Uh, and you would put it through a, a mold. You'd squish it through, and, you know, a shape would come out the other side. Well, that's what humanity is. And the forces of nature are the, the, the forces of change represented by this tower card. And what the universe is, or what this big change that we're trying to uh, go through that we're going to go through is like a mold or let's say it's a wall, right? And it's got a, it's got a shape cut out, right? So the, the, this big ball of clay, right, needs to go through this wall. It needs to go through the shape. Let's say it's shaped like a star just to be, just to have, a, you know, a, an image in mind, right? And the natural law forces or these new vibrations coming in are saying, well, here's the big bulk of humanity represented by this ball of clay, this Play-Doh, right? And it needs to go through this star-shaped gate or portal, okay? And there is no choice as to whether it's going through. Oh, it's going through. The question is, is it going to, while it's on this side of this gate or portal, is it going to realign itself and streamline itself and mold itself of its own volition and its own free will into a shape that is conducive to going through the, uh, the, the shape, the cutout, right, without being splattered up against the wall and forced through, okay? This is why we call it a force of nature. Force. It's going to be forced. Nat you don't have a choice in natural law progression. It's a force. This is why it's called a force of nature, ladies and gentlemen. There is no choice to whether to comply with that or not. It's going to happen. The only choice is how much damage happens on this end of the transition. Where do we streamline ourselves? And do we already 
mold ourselves into a new form, and we go through peacefully. We'll be right back after these messages, folks. All right, so we were talking about the tower card on the macrocosmic tree of life before we went to that last break. And we saw how the tower card uh, at the hub, the heart chakra location, represents change. And indeed, as we've talked about many times here, the uh, aspect of care, okay, is the generative principle. It is what actually creates the reality that we experience, okay? And again, this is the um, central aspect of the uh, triangle that forms the uh, world in the Kabbalistic tradition known as Bria. Uh, I'm sorry, known as um, <coughs> uh, above, uh, yeah, um, no, Yes, Bria is the, is the creative world, okay? So this is the world above yet zero, which is what we talked about with the three um, uh, uh, cards, the sun, the moon, and the star. Uh, this world of the triangle that is formed by the tower, the devil, and, temp- and the temperance card, okay, formed the world known as Bria in Kabbalah, the creative world. And again, this connects back with the, cr- with the generative principle, okay, of care, and how much we align ourselves with the forces of natural law. So the devil card, okay, which is the next card upward on the tree of life on the left-hand side, on the middle of the left-hand pillar of the tree, okay? This is on the pillar of severity, and this card is in the position of the sephirah known as geburah, which means severity. And indeed, it is a card depicting severity. The devil card ultimately represents in its highest aspect going against the forces of natural law okay so this is our free will decision not to engage higher levels of awareness not to engage self-knowledge in which case we have the option to enslave ourselves and you see there the two beings the male and the female that are chained and subordinate to the devil, represented, uh, the, the, representing the Satan force, okay, which is the force of fear, which is the force of um, uh, devolution in, in consciousness. Okay? Yet, look at the chains. Look at card number 15 of the major arcana, the devil card. Okay? It may be a negative card in its, in its uh, connotations and its implications and its symbolism, but there is hope in this card, actually, because the chains are set lightly around the neck. They're not fastened super tight, choking the two beings, the, the male and female. They are put upon them themselves. They could lift these chains off of their neck at any time. See, this symbolism is very specific. It indicates that we have the free will choice to discontinue our current ways that are basically flying in the face of natural law principles. We can do that at any time. We have the free will to do that. And we can go over to the temperance card, which represents, again, an angel, okay, with the, the flow. This angel has the flow of energy going. It is the alchemy card. Some decks call this alchemy. Some decks call this simply art, A-R-T, the art, okay, as you'll hear some occult sciences referred to as particularly alchemy. So this is the alchemist card. This is the, on the pillar of mercy, the right-hand pillar, the right-hand path. And this temperance card, it represents the sephiroth known as hesed, which means mercy. Okay, so these are the central hubs of these two pillars, and they represent going along with natural law or refusal to go along with natural law. So that's temperance is becoming the alchemist. It is uh, accepting the natural law forces. It is the, the positive aspects of natural law which are there to teach us, are there to help us to evolve. Okay, so you can look at this is natural law itself, these two cards. And one, rep- and one represents our choice to go along with it. One represents our choice to uh, disengage from it. 
okay? And both of them are connected to the tower card in this triangle of Bria as the creative world because this is how we create our reality. We create our reality through either the learning of and acceptance of natural law forces or ignoring them, in which case our life becomes severe. If we accept them, we understand them, we accept them, and we live in harmony with them, we go toward the pillar of mercy, and life becomes a flow guided by angelic forces. Okay? If we go along with, if we refuse to go along with natural law forces that are there really for our betterment, okay, we enslave ourselves, but we can choose to undo that at any time because the chains are not set tightly. Okay? It's our free will decision to fly in the face of natural law, okay? And we are ruled by the Satan principle, okay? Which is the opposer, the adversary, the one who tears us apart from within because we are ultimately a, non, uh, a non-unified being. We are, exist in a state of duality, okay? Depicted by the man and the woman separated and chained, but they have chained themselves, And that's what we're doing. That's the path we're on, folks. You want to know where humanity is? You want to know the best example of what humanity is right now? It's card number 15 of the Major Arcana, the Devil card. That's what we've done to ourselves. No one has done it to us. We've done it to ourselves. And people will disagree with that, and they'll pound their fists on the wall. They'll pound their fists on the desk. They'll curse my name for daring to say that. It's other people's manipulation. It's just, this is all something being done to us. We're victims. Poor humanity. We're victims. Well, you keep going right on ahead with that apologetic worldview, okay, and keep making excuses and keep pointing the finger outward, okay? And I'll keep helping people by helping them point their finger inward because that's where change happens. That's why the change card is on the middle pillar and it's associated with the heart, ladies and gentlemen. That's where change happens, within the individual, and it's a one-on-one work that needs to be done from within with each individual person. Nobody can do it for you. They can only inspire you or influence you or help you, but you have to do the work yourself for change. Okay? So... That triangle helps explain the creative forces at work in the world. Now we go up to the top triangle, the world of absolute, and I hope I can explain this in 10 minutes. We'll see what we can do. If not, we'll carry us over a bit into the next show. But uh, let's continue with the final three cards. We have at the top triangle the death card, okay, the hanged man, and justice, okay? So the death card up at the top left-hand side of the pillar of severity represents the forces of involution, okay? Uh, This represents uh, the decay elements of nature, that things always move into different forms. Uh, Things don't stay the same. Uh, They are always changing into different forms. Energy uh, remains, but it takes on new forms, and, you know, life uh, passes through uh, stages where, It exists in incarnation, and then it goes back into the no thing, and then back into a state of physical being or incarnation, and that is a cyclical process. So this death card is what you could consider a force of involution. Um, And again, it's on the internal aspect of the, uh, uh, the, the Kabbalistic tree on the pillar of severity, okay? The hangman card uh, would seemingly be a negative card, but I don't look at it that way as anyone who really understands the deeper esoteric meaning. This is the evolutionary principles inherent in creation, and this is the forces of nature uh, coming, working down, coming down through the physical to evolve it, okay? Represented by uh, the initiate being put upon the world tree or the cross, okay? This is a crucified being, but he is an illuminate, okay? He is, uh, the forces of nature have been made known to him, and therefore he has this halo around his head as an illuminated being, and he is not actually suffering. This is the, the evolutionary forces coming into uh, the flesh, I guess you could look at it as, coming down through the spiritual world and being grasped, grasped while in the flesh. So this is an initiate 
who has understood natural law, and he understands that while it may bind him, um, it is uh, something that is there for our evolutionary development in consciousness. And it is that evolutionary force itself that this card represents in the macrocosmic domain. Okay? The hanged man card. Card number, um, um, what is that? Uh, that's uh, 12, I believe. Um, am I? Yes, 12. Okay? So moving upward to the top level of the macrocosmic tree of life uh, of the Kabbalah's major, of the Tarot's major uh, arcana, we have card number 11. Okay? And this is justice. Okay? This is the card that represents balance. This is the card that represents truth. And this is the card that represents equilibrium and justice. And that's why it is called that. Okay? This is the goal of creation. This is what the universe is seeking to accomplish. This is the end result of the great work, as it is called in the hermetic tradition and the alchemical tradition. The state of equilibrium, you see again, it's a king seated between two pillars. He holds the sword of truth in his right hand. Proper moral action has been attained. Somebody is released from basic law. They are king now. They are the the ultimate sovereign being the king because they do right for the sake of doing right, not because they are bound by law and consequences. Uh, Ultimately, this is the the stage of evolutionary development that the higher will of the universe that is driving all of this, uh, all of this um, movement, all of these forces, is trying to put into place. It wants balance. It wants equilibrium. It wants truth. It wants justice. And that's what this card ultimately represents. And you see the scales of truth and justice there, along with the sword of truth and the crowned king between the two pillars as an evolutionary synthesis between the cosmic male and female forces or the yang and yin energies. Now, in older decks, this card was actually reversed with the eight card, which is the strength card or the card that represents courage. And this card was put into the position on the microcosmic tree of the sphere of Hod, okay? Um, In newer decks, these cards are reversed to reflect that the courage principle is part of the microcosmic tree and that justice is the ultimate goal of the the universe itself, of the the macrocosmic forces at work, okay? Now, I agree with the current um, placement of the cards as you're seeing them on these images, But the reason that uh, older occult traditions reverse these cards is because they crowned courage as the ultimate force of creation, as the ultimate thing that the universe was trying to create because without it, nothing really changes and gets done. And we've emphasized over many weeks how important courage is uh, to the spiritual journey. So I would say that these cards are almost interchangeable as well. I, I prefer to tend to uh, go with the arrangement, again, as you see them on the images I've depicted. However, uh, when you look at certain tarot decks, you will see these two cards reversed, and that is why. This is an, an homage to courage itself, saying that ultimately, this is what the universe reveres above all else. And I couldn't agree more. So I understand why this reversal was done. People often claim that this is a black magic reversal or something like that. It's nothing of the kind, okay? Uh, This is done because uh, they were alluding to what the ultimate thing that we need more than anything else is, and that is courage to move forward in consciousness. Uh, And when we do that, we'll become the sovereign king, the justice card. And uh, that's ultimately what the universe wants to give us, freedom. True freedom is what this card ultimately represents. And um, uh, it represents, again, being 
rising even above law to the cosmic consciousness position. Okay, this is what the universe is trying to ultimately create, and it's freedom from law itself, even the natural law, okay? Because you won't need to be bound by the, the, the repercussions of going against natural law because you'll follow it simply because the recognition that it is simply right and goodness and justice, okay, will be enshrined, okay, as king. That's all, that's all we really have time for here tonight, folks. Hope you've enjoyed our lessons on the tarot. I hope you'll study the tradition further. You've been listening to What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. Thanks for listening, folks. I'll see you here next Tuesday evening. Good night.